We are live here with Monk Chaitanya Charan. How are you? Welcome to the studios here at Mystic Mandala. We are so excited to have you here and to launch your newest book, Wisdom from the Ramayan. Now, it's really special for us as we're getting close here to our Diwali Mela Festival on October 27th at the South Fork Ranch. And, you know, Diwali itself... Um, it has, you know, many different meanings according to where you're from in India. Now, in India, um, although, I mean, how big is India in comparison to, like, let's say some of the states in the U.S.? So Texas is really big. California is really big. If we put those together and maybe <laughs> I'm not sure what the, <laughs> the geographic of it. But the thing is, you know, India being the size that it is has so many languages, has so many, it has so much diversity. And so Diwali can mean something different um, to, uh, to, to, to different people according to where you're from. But one aspect of Diwali the festival of lights is that pastime of Ram coming back um, to Ayodhya from exile, and he was welcomed with this these beautiful lights that that um, lit the way alongside here, welcoming Sita and Ram back to their homeland they were exiled from. So I think this is a perfect time to release this book and to we'll dive in uh, to the inspiration behind the book but first let's talk about Chaitanya Charan so you have how many books that you've written 22 till now 22 when when was your first book launched do you remember it was 2004 and it's 2018 <laughs> 22 books wow that's super impressive. <laughs> so, um, uh, so 22 books, and we have a couple of them here. Most of these are available on uh, Amazon.com. So we have this one, which is a favorite. This is Gita for Daily Enlightenment. So if you're like me, I am a poem reader, uh, to be very honest. I, uh, to get through a book is a big deal for me. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah. So... It's great for me to read this because with the Bhagavad Gita, there's a lot of commentary. It takes time for me to get through it. This kind of gives me that inspiration that every day I'm going to read, you know, one meditation on the Bhagavad Gita, and I'm going to be able to apply that in my life in a relatable way. So listen, folks, the Bhagavad Gita, I mean, the pastime of the Bhagavad Gita happened, you know, over 5,000 years ago. And how do, how does this even make sense? I mean, how is this even relatable in my life right now? I'm in 2018 with two kids, you know, I'm a mom, I'm a businesswoman. I mean, how can I relate the Bhagavad Gita in my life? Well, you know, if you flip through the pages here, that what's great about, um, about this book is you can relate um, these different relationships, experiences, teachings, meditations. You can relate it in your life today, in 2018 and tomorrow, um, in 2019 coming up in the next year. It's so relatable and I'm so thankful that you wrote this. I'm a big fan of it and I read it um, daily. So thank you for this. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's many, many books as he, that part, he's written. This book is a part of a series which I have on my website I call gitadaily.com where I write every day on the Gita a small 300 word meditation and there are three reflection questions also. So even if you can't get the book, if you subscribe for gitadaily.com, you can connect with the articles on the Gita from there also. Wonderful. So that is a daily Gita meditation that he posts every day. Uh, and you can find out more about that. We will be posting more of that information as we move forward through the show. Um, we can post that information on our um, comments below. And if you're tuning in, please let us know. You know, what's wonderful about um, having someone like uh, Chaitanya Turan here in the studios with us is that, you know, it really encourages us on our own, um, you know, spiritual path. We are all on our, on our own pathway, you know, some... They move faster, some they move a little bit slower, but the idea is that you're on a path. And um, one thing that I want to express in gratitude are these books that 
sometimes for me, it's a little intimidating, especially coming from a complete, I mean, we're, we're talking a completely different um, upbringing, you know, <laughs> mm. um, the Ramayan, the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharat, you know, these shlokas, I mean, what is this? I was born here in the US, you know, but somehow I can, through your books and through these relatable concepts, I'm able to apply this knowledge um, in my life. And with the wisdom from the Ramayan, um, you'll see, you know, his um, his branding here. You'll see it here. This is kind of like what the book's about. And it's um, on life and relationships. So you have taken the um, persons, I'll say persons, not characters, because this is real life. This is a true story, folks. The persons of the Ramayan, and you have... Um, created accessibility to their experiences and to their relationships and um, you have um, successfully you know created this link between now and then you know almost like a family tree you know yeah. when when you have a family tree and you're mapping out where you're from and you know who your great great grandfather is and like I have his nose and, oh, I have, you know, my, my great, 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 great aunt's ears or like whatever it is, right? So you have applied these situations that have happened in the Ramayan and you have said, hold on a second. Everyone has issues with relationships. Everyone is having that issue with their family member. How can they connect with them? How can they understand where they're coming from? Um, everyone has friendships and, and within that friendship, within that relationship, there are struggles. And there's also triumphs. So mm. how do we experience both? So in the wisdoms, uh, wisdom from the Ramayan, he has taken examples of these types of relationships and provided not only um, not only, you know, like a comparison or like, you know, relatability, but he's provided remedies on how to move through these struggles that we have every day and say, hey, someone else is going through this too. And they've been going through it for some time. Like <laughs> the Ramayan happened how many years ago? <laughs> like, okay, thousands. thousands of years ago. So for thousands of years. <laughs> People have been uh, dealing with these issues and these relationships. And for thousands of years more, they're going to be dealing with these relationships and instances. But we can get through it together. So I want you to read your inspiration behind this book. He's actually picked... Um, a couple, um, you know, a couple things that he wants to read out to you, um, to all of you. Again, this will be available on Amazon.com here in the next coming weeks. You can order it today um, on Gita Daily Wisdom at gmail.com. And you can find more about monk um, Chaitanya Charan on his website, GitaDailyWisdom.com. Um, there'll be more information about him, his story, 22 books later. And how he's here in Dallas with all of us. <laughs> and in the meantime, um, can you read us this, this sure. little um, excerpt here from your book? This is Wisdom from the Ramayan. You can order it again, GitaDailyWisdom at gmail.com and check it out on Amazon here in the next coming weeks. So thank you for having me here. Mm -hmm. And now you talked about being a bridge from the past to the present. So the theme I feel of the spiritual tradition of India is from your place at your pace access the grace so we all can from wherever we are whatever path whatever journey we can access the grace mm. so the incident that inspired me to write this book was two of my close friends were having a very severe quarrel with each other oh. and I heard both of their sides I just felt that both of them were talking past each other. Mm. So that was the time when Ram Naomi was there, the time when Ram was appeared in the world. So I chose a story from the Ramayana and I spoke that. And I analyzed that in a way. And after that, both of them met each other and they reconciled. So that was the time it struck me that these stories, which I had grown up since my childhood hearing, from my grandparents and parents, I realized they were just not the stories. They were 
timeless archetypes of how we human beings function. The story that influenced them so much and the story that inspired this book is the story of two personality persons who were brothers and heirs to a kingdom. They were Wali and Sugriv. And once they had gone for a fight together, and while they had gone for a fight against a wicked demon, they went inside, the demon fled into a cave, and Wali wanted to go in, and he told Sugri, wait outside. And Wali went in for a long time, he didn't come back, and finally he heard the demon screaming, but he didn't hear Wali. So after waiting for some time, Sugri thought that, I've heard the demon, but not my brother. So my brother has been killed. And he thought that if this demon is so powerful, he could kill my brother. Then he will kill me. He will devastate our kingdom. Mm. So better, me, better let me lock him up in the cave. And he covered the cave with a huge boulder. He came back to the kingdom, grieved the loss of his brother. They had a statewide period of mourning. And then he became, as per the request of the courtiers and the citizens, he became the next king. And in the meanwhile, after some time, Wali came back. And Wali had been exhausted with the fight. So he had finished the demon, but he had not roared in victory because he wanted to conserve his energy and he was so tired. And with great difficulty, he had come out of the cave. And finally, when he came back to the kingdom and he saw Sugriv sitting on the throne, he thought Sugriv conspired Shame. to trap me there. And that's how he took away my throne and he fiercely attacked Sugriv. Sugriv tried to explain, but he was just not ready to hear. So let's talk about that moment. Um, we've all been there. Yeah. We've walked into something. Have it being physically walking into something or emotionally walking into something, you know, where you're like, hold on a second. What about me? You know, what about me? Like, how could he take over my kingdom? He was my brother. Like, you know, I went in to fight this demon for us, for our kingdom, right? And they were so close. I mean, they were super close, you know, best friends, not just brothers, but like best friends, you know, like the other half, like Krishna Balaram, <laughs> you know, they were so close. So that feeling of complete and utter, like, you know, the, the, the betrayal. betrayal at the highest point. Like everything I've done for you and what are you doing for me? You've taken this away from me. So that's how he's feeling. And the brother, <laughs> you know, thinking that the brother is dead in his heart, there's a little bit of, hold on a second. I thought you were dead, right? So it's like, I, I, I'm trying to take care of the kingdom. This is our duty. But at the same time, like I was explaining to uh Chaitanya Charan, my, you know, interpretation of hate and that hate is actually a symptom of love because you can't really hate someone. You can't have that much anguish, that much energy, that much emotion if you don't love the person. So in that love, this anger, this hate, this resentment, this betrayal of himself thinking, here's my brother coming back and seeing me as this person. So I'd love to see what happens further in the story. Yeah. So here basically both of them, the title in this book is called Wali Sugriv, Judging Without Understanding. Mm. So now both of them made the same mistake actually. When we, when Sugriv judged without understanding, thinking that my brother has been killed. And Wali also judged without understanding, thinking my brother has betrayed me. So all of us, when we function and interact with others, we have a limited picture of reality. So based on what's where Sugriv was, it was a reasonable inference. Maybe Wali is killed. Based on where Wali was, it was a reasonable inference how Sugriv has betrayed me. Hmm. But there was a difference. And what was the difference? That was that Wali so both Sugriv and Wali arrived at mistaken inferences. I'm reading from the book here. Sugriv about Wali's death and Wali about Sugriv's treachery. The difference between them was that Sugriv had little opportunity to test his inference. 
the possibility of the demon coming out was too hazardous. But Wali had abundant opportunity to test his inference. Being stronger, he could afford to give Sugriva hearing. Moreover, Sugriva was no untrustworthy demon, but was his upright brother, a brother who had served him faithfully as a right-hand man for many years. Mm. Sugriv, because of both his relationship and his track record, deserved a proper hearing before being judged. Unfortunately, Wali was too sure of his reading of the situation and felt no need to seek any clarification. So we all will judge in a particular way based on what we observe. But the key is we need to let the other person speak. Mm -hmm. Not just speak with words, but hear with our heart. Try to understand their perspective. So actually, I read a quote um, some time ago. It might have been on my Facebook wall. Thank you to all my Facebook friends that post these inspirational quotes on my wall. But it said that when we choose to listen to hear rather than to listen, to respond at that moment, at that moment, we're actually able to understand. So when we choose, when we're listening, we're listening to hear it and to understand it and to let it process rather than hear to have a response. Only then are you actually hearing that person. Yeah. So try to have that moment where you're said, okay, you know what? I hear you. And you're right. And that's the hardest thing to say. You're right. This is wrong. I still feel like this. You know, I, I, I still have this ego. I, I still feel like my reasoning is the right reasoning and that my choice and response is the right response. But I do hear you and I understand. Because when you admit it's the ego, which it is likely That's on true. both sides. Both sides. Yeah. <laughs> when you I, admit that, only then can you take that next step in the relationship. You know, I often say that there are dangerous sports where people jump from mountain tops, mm -hmm. jump from airplanes. But the most dangerous jumping is jumping to conclusions. Wow, I had to take a breath on that one. <laughs> I had to, oh, you're right. Hmm. So here, when they just jump to a conclusion, when Sugriva, Wali jumped to this conclusion, he exiled his brother, he persecuted his brother, hmm. he even tried to assassinate him. Wow. And eventually it is Ram who had to intervene. And it is by Ram's intervention that the two brothers reconciled with each other. Mm. And that reconciliation fortunately happened. But for some of us, we might just live with grudges. Based on our own perceptions of the situations, we may live it lifelong. The most, the heaviest thing to hold in life is actually a grudge. It doesn't weigh us down physically, but it weighs us down emotionally. And that emotional weight, it chokes us in many, many wonderful things that we could have done. So how the reconciliation happened, that's described further in this chapter. This is an example of how these incidents spoken a long time ago. They address today's issues. So as a part of the rectification, which Wali did eventually when Ram clarified, and Ram intervened and set the record straight. So I talk about three steps for reconciliation as A, A, A. A is acknowledge, apologize, and amend. Let's say it again. <laughs> <laughs> acknowledge. Yeah, I made a mistake. I, did, I thought like this, but it was like this. I made a mistake. Just acknowledging removes much of the hostility and animosity that is there. So that's saying, I hear you. Yes. That's saying you're backing up for a second. I hear you. That's acknowledging. What's the second? Apologize. Apologize. Oh, <laughs> no one likes to apologize. Yeah. <laughs> no one likes to sincerely apologize when they're in that moment because they feel they're right. Even if you acknowledge the part, even if you acknowledge that you're hearing them, to take that moment to say, I apologize. Don't say I apologize for my part and expect, no, <laughs> I apologize. So 
acknowledge, apologize, and the third one. That is amend. Amend. Set things right to whatever way we can. And if we do this, then we can actually not only overcome the problem that is there, the rupture that is in the relationship. Sometimes actually the relationship can become stronger. Hmm. Because the relationships that are forged through fire, they actually become the strongest. Now, before Ram comes in here and kind of saves the day, I want to ask a question. Um, so the three the, the process here, the first process is to acknowledge them, acknowledge what they're saying, hear them, hear them without responding, hear them for what they're saying, listen to them and see that, hey, actually there is something there that I've done. But the second part, the apology part, do you apologize in a way where you are um, not expecting an apology in return? Because yeah. you see, it's like I'm following this process, but they aren't following this process. So, so it's like you can kind of get like lost in that. You can kind of get stuck there. Like, okay, I've acknowledged them. I've heard them. I'm listening to them. I've apologized, but they're not apologizing. So how can we amend? So what is that? Like, what is the in between step? Is it that you apologize without expectation? Is it that you you're doing this for yourself, like you're, for your own self, like you know your self ego, like to get through it? I mean, that's my question. What is that in between of what if they're not reciprocating? Yeah, that's that's a very good point. Generally, the way I put it is that we have horizontal relationship with others, and we have a vertical relationship with the divine. Hmm. So, if we are simply responding to others the way they are acting, then there is nothing spiritual in that relationship. So we act in a way that will serve the divine, will please the divine. We don't necessarily expect the other person to reciprocate. If they reciprocate, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. The example I give for this is, suppose someone is an attendant in a cloth shop and this attendant shows the clothes or explains the clothes to customers who come there. And there is a particular customer who is extremely crotchety, criticizing, blaming, demanding, seeing hundreds of dresses but not taking any. Now the attendant might get frustrated by that. But the attendant knows that my boss is watching me. And my salary is coming not just from this customer, it's coming from my boss. So oh, they may not make the sale, but if they stay courteous, stay polite, the boss will be pleased. And the boss may come and say later, you know how to deal with tough people. You know, I interest you this whole floor. You train other people how to deal with tough people. Hmm. So there might be a failure in terms of making the sale. But there'll be success in terms of pleasing the boss and getting a raise, getting a promotion. So for us, especially if you're spiritually minded, every interaction is not just an interaction with that person. It's an interaction even with the divine. And there are richer rewards which come when we come closer to the divine. When we have that perspective that I'm acting this way, not just so that the other person will act that way. It'll be natural human expectation of reciprocation. Huh. So essentially to sort of reiterate what you're saying, if I'm understanding it correctly, is that, you know, your relationship with others is on, you know, this this um horizontal this horizontal platform. So that means like when you're, for example, when you're driving, you're driving one way or the other, right? It's one way or the other, like this horizontally. But when you fly, you go and you extend up. So what he's saying is your relationship with the divine, the reciprocation of that is the benefits of that are stronger. They're, they last longer and you will get more gratification from that than the gratification you're getting with these relationships. These relationships are important, but rather than seeing them for the self, as this temporary person in this temporary situation, in this temporary relationship, you see it as an eternal relationship. This person is eternal. 
I will likely have relationships with them in the future. And there may be problems. But my relationship, my strongest relationship, my reason for being is my relationship with the divine. And if I see that divinity in every person and I see that relationship in every person, that my expectation for these horizontal relationships will diminish a little bit. It's like, it's like, for example, when you're eating dinner, because I like to reference things to food. I like food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like to eat. It's a common universal <laughs> denominator. Everyone can <laughs> I like to eat. So in my relation to food, I know that if I finish what's on my plate, which is good, it's delicious, I'm going to get that slice of cake, that one that I really want. Or that galubjman that's super juicy. I'm just ready to eat it. So right now what I'm enjoying, the temporary satisfaction of that is satisfying. But that goal of being able to reach that slice of cake is in my mind. And I can almost taste the cake. It's there. It's tangible. I'm not even eating it yet. But knowing that when I finish this meal... I'm going to get it. So when you're with these relationships with others and you know that this situation, this circumstance that you're having, you have to get through it to get to that next place within yourself. And that place is your relationship with divinity. So what does Ram do? I'm interested to know. Now that the brothers were fighting, right? Ram comes in and what does Ram say? Actually... The situation has come to a level at that particular point where Vali is out to kill Sugriva. He tries various times. And Vali, his own wife, Tara, she tells him, unite with Sugriva. Hmm. But she just he just brushes her aside. And then there is a final confrontation that is unfortunately fatal. In which Wali succumbs to an arrow of Ram. But at that time when Ram comes in front of him, he says, Wali, if you want, I can give you your life back right now. But he said, I want to tell you, the way you treated your brother was terrible. You not only attacked him, you took away his kingdom, you took away his wife, you exiled him to the forest, you tried to kill him. He says, this is the punishment that you deserve for it. If you feel it is unfair, I am ready to give you back your life right away. At that time, when Wali's heart is being pierced by the arrow of Ram, mm. the words of Ram pierce into his heart also. Till that time, when he had that, hot, that haughtiness that I am the king and I know, no words would enter into his heart. At that time, he speaks memorably. He says, Oh Ram, lives many I will get, but a death in your presence is rare indeed. And he has a jewel necklace, which has celestial powers, because of which, although the arrow is there in his heart, he's still alive. And his own son has come there. And he would naturally have given this, which is a protector of life to his son. But he turns towards Sugriva. And Sugriva, he says that I treated you unfairly I'm sorry for that and he gives that necklace to Ram, to Sugriva now at one level we might feel that it's a tragedy that one of them had to die but it's not a tragedy because life is eternal mm. and the soul lives on and if the soul is freed from negativity and animosity in this life, in any particular relationship, the soul becomes free to rise to a higher level. So there is a happy ending to the story at the spiritual level. Because by departing in the presence of Ram, Wali attains the supreme perfection. He becomes liberated. He becomes reunited with the divine in the eternal abode. But before that, he's reunited with his own brother. Wow. So there's, you know, there's something to be seen here.
and you're looking at this from you know with our eyes you know here you're you're in the moment of death right we all fear death <laughs> you're in the moment of death and it's coming it's coming for everyone everyone will have that moment in that moment rather than feeling that fear and also you know rather than seeing that this person is dying again we're going on the horizontal and the vertical the horizontal um, look of this situation is here the other brother is dying the other brother gets the kingdom right that's yeah. what happens but the vertical the divinity right that's the all end be all goal right that is what we're trying to do here is structure our lives to be able to allow this knowledge to pierce our hearts our hard hearts it becomes hard we're we're here and we're surrounded with so many so much negativity and so many things that we allow in um, to, to to sort of make it hard. So in this moment of death, you can look at it at this person died and the other person got the throne. Or you can look at it that this person died and became liberated. So yeah. what is our goal? Is our goal to, you know, to reply? Just to this point of being liberated or just not just dying. You, know, you might have say uh, some action movie in mm. which a hero is there in a car and the car is just heading straight to a cliff mm. and then the car just goes off the cliff and crashes and explodes you see the hero died but in that action movie just as the hero is about to go off the car is about to go off the cliff say somebody from a helicopter from above catches the hero sends a rope down and the hero catches the rope and is pulled out of it so similarly for us, the body is like our vehicle and the soul is inside the body. And this body at the moment of death is like the vehicle that is going to go off the cliff and it's going to be destroyed. But the soul that is detached, the soul that is more than detached from the world, the soul that is attached to the divine gets liberated. Mm. And liberation is a state of freedom for eternal love. We exist with Ram, with Krishna, with Vishnu, with the divine hmm. in an eternal kingdom. And to attain that kingdom wherein we reciprocate love eternally with him, that is life's supreme perfection. Hmm. That is what Laksh that is what Wali attained. So <laughs> Again, when reading the Ramayan, sometimes it could be difficult to, you know, to relate to this. This is a very intense uh, pastime, you know. Um, but there is a way. We all have struggles. We have relationships. We have, let's just even, you know, we have relationships, but let's bring it down. We have relationships with family members that we are struggling with. Okay, we all have them. In every family, there are differences. And we have that moment in every circumstance where we can ask ourselves, have we acknowledged? Have we heard that person without responding? Have we apologized? Now I ask the question, what happens if they don't acknowledge and they don't apologize? Right? What happens with that? But he clearly answered that there are two types of relationships. There's your relationships on a vertical and the relationships on a horizontal. So you, you look at the situation as your relationship on a vertical. You see, although this relationship is horizontal, I see the divinity in this person. And you don't think I'll wait for them to apologize. I'll wait for them to acknowledge there's no need. It may not happen. But you must release that from your heart. You must see the Atma, the Paramatma, that is the divinity within that person, right? The Atma is the soul. The Paramatma is within that soul. That's the divinity that is within that soul. You acknowledge that. You apologize to that. Not to the person, not to the body, not to the vehicle. You're actually apologizing to that divinity. This is a divine person behind this relationship, behind whatever, this is a divine person and I acknowledge and I hear you and I apologize to you and I amend this relationship. 
Because what's more important than that circumstance, what's more important even really to that relationship being it your sister or your brother, your father, your mother, your daughter, whatever it may be, what's more important is that these people stay with you. And not only does that relationship stay with you, but your reaction to that relationship stays with you. So you must see yourself as a divine being. See those around you as divine beings and create relationships with them based on divinity, not based on this horizontal relationship. I was so happy to have you here and to read this book, Wisdom from the Ramayana, as we move into our, um, our festival season of Navratri and Diwali. We're celebrating Diwali at, at South Fork Ranch on October 27th. And please come. There'll be a beautiful temple set up there, a Ram Dubar of Ram, Sita, Lakshman, Hanuman. Um, there'll be festivities. And we can all come together and remember that we are all divine souls. We can all welcome each other with divinity and, and see that light within all of us. And again, you can go to um, GitaDaily.com. You can find more information about all of his talks. He has talks daily on his uh, or meditations daily on his uh, website. You can find out more about Chaitanya Charan Das and as well about his book, wisdom from the Ramayana. You can absolutely apply this in your life. Allow that, that arrow to pierce your heart and allow even just a little bit of that light in. Each time that we do that daily, if every day, every day, every day, we allow that light, you'll see it change. And there is this beautiful verse, one of my favorites from the Bhagavad Gita, that I wanted to read. It's chapter 2, text 14. This is actually a verse my daughter, both my daughters actually, one is 4 and one is 12. They sing this verse every morning, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, because they go to Gurukul. So they learn these verses with song. Oh, okay. So they have like all these different songs that they sing. And, and this one, although I won't say it as nicely as they do because they say it daily, we'll read the Sanskrit. And then I want to read the translation of the verse. And this is something that... Um, that you can learn to apply absolutely today, tomorrow, and every day. So it's matra sparsas tu kanteya sitos nasuka duhukada agam paino nityas tam sitasva bharata. And it says, O son of Kunti, the non permanent appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearance in due course are like the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. They arise from sense perception, O Saikan of Bharat, and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. So the song they sing is like, what is it like? Happiness and pain come and go, just like the summer and the winter snow. Sometimes it feels good, sometimes it feels bad. Tolerate it without becoming sad. Beautiful. <laughs> so they sing that every day in the morning when we're eating breakfast. And it's like their way of starting the day in a positive way. Like, hey, things are going to happen to me today. You know, my sister, she may say something wrong or she may steal my slime or she may, whatever, play with my toys and I'm going to become distressed or I'm going to become happy. But I just tolerate it. I just see the divinity in their heart. I see them as that vertical relationship. I see them for who they truly are, sat, chit, ananda, eternally full of bliss, knowledge, and I accept it. I apologize and I amend. A, A, A. That is our slogan, our mantra, our shloka. Thank you so much for coming and seeing us. Again, Dwali Mela, October 27th, South Fork Ranch. Come and see us, and uh, I will have more information about these books here commented below. You can also visit his website, gitadaily.com, and in addition to that, these will be available on Amazon very, very soon, so check out all of his 22 books. <laughs> Chaitanya Sharan, thank you so much for coming. Hariyam Tetsa, thank you. Thank you.